Hello. 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 Uh, that sounds good to me. Okay. Brilliant. Welcome, uh, everybody, um, to this uh, important event, I think, because it's exactly one year today before um, those of you in the eco industry don't have a choice anymore, and we have to do this PAS 2035 thing, albeit lots of you are already starting early because you're so keen on it. Um, but it is an important milestone. It's a bit like uh, the sort of the countdown to the Olympic Games. Um, so really the, the question today is, is how ready are we uh, and what can we do uh, collaboratively and, and, and working with each other to sort of help um, move the whole sort of project and programme along. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen um, to go through a few bits and pieces with you. Okay, um, so I'm hoping now you can see the... Uh, presentation yeah. on screen. Great. Um, now, uh, the, the agenda for today is uh, I've got 10 minutes of stuff just to whiz through at the start. Um, then we're going to hear from uh, Simon Ayres, who's the Chief Executive of Trustmark. And I think you all by now, if you don't know what Trustmark's role in this is by now, you've probably um, been on, a, on another planet. But Simon's going to tell us all about that. Um, we're we're going to hear from uh, Adrian Wright, um, who is the chair of our Centre of Excellence Eco Working Group and we've been doing some great work through that group lately so he's going to bring us up to speed on that uh, and then after that we go into um, if you were on our previous retrofit coordinator summit we're going into a familiar format of uh, question time so uh, many of you have submitted questions through the registration process uh, and we'll be putting that to uh, our panel. Um, we've got so many this time, we're gonna have to get through them a lot quicker than we did last time. <laughs> but I'm still hoping that we, um, we'll have some time at the end for a bit of a closing discussion uh, on that and, and a sort of look ahead to the next year and as I say, really what we need to do uh, to move forwards. Um, so in the registration process, I asked you a few questions um, and I've just included a few diagrams here to set the scene. Um, one of the questions um, was, do you get PAS 2035? So do you have a clear gap grasp of, of its requirements? Um, I think I was quite encouraged by this because only 1% of 150 delegates said, no, I don't get it at all, um, which is good. But we may need to do a bit of work with that individual. 37% um, uh, said, yes, I get it, great. And that's a much bigger proportion than we would have had in March when we asked a similar question. Um, and there, almost two thirds of you are saying, yeah, I'm sort of, I get some of it, I'm getting there, which is good, but there's a lot more to be done, clearly. Um, we also asked, uh, asked you if you were ready for the PAS, um, and a similar sort of response, really, that it's a work in progress, 69% uh, saying somewhat prepared, 13%, very encouraging, 13% totally prepared, which is great. Uh, and then um, just under 20% either totally or not very prepared. Um, you're not alone, whichever of those boxes you're in, you're not alone. Um, and um, I think what's become very clear over the last couple of months is that there's gonna be a lot of support put in place to help the whole industry through this process. Um, and then finally we asked, will it happen at all? So um, certainly at the last coordinator summit, we, there was a view, some people had the view that this will all go away. Um, and that sentiment seems to now have almost gone. So a very, very small number saying, no, this is, this is all gonna go away, it's a bad dream. Um, so 63%, um, yes, it will come into effect on the 1st of July, 2021. Uh, and 36% sort of saying, no, it, it'll be postponed, which uh, we have to say that kind of thing has happened in the past. So um, it's not that out, uh, outlandish. Um, and so all of those questions really beg the question, are we, are we as an industry ready? Um, now we've got on this call a number of installers who I know are already on the 2019 as 2030 standard and um, in the eco market, the uplift that's available has driven quite a lot of people in that direction or it's just that it's your, turn, your time in the annual renewal cycle. Um, so it's already happening um, and it's more real for some people than it is for others. Um, We've also got a data warehouse open under Trustmark um, and lodgements being made in it. One of the tongue in cheek, cheek questions um, I received was, has anyone actually lodged a project yet? And I think there's actually quite a large number of projects that have been lodged. I'm sure Phil Mason will tell us more about that later. Um, we've got an encouraging number of coordinators studying. Um, 
and a quarter of those people, so 450 are currently studying, and it's a number growing every day, um, quicker and quicker actually, um, a hundred of, uh, over a hundred, just over a hundred have now graduated. But as far as we understand it, only 20 are currently practicing. So there's, there's about 80 of you so far who've finished a course, but not registered with one of the accreditation schemes yet, which is something we need to address. Um, we know that there's a big gap between theory and practice with this. And um, that it's very clear that this sort of new profession of well, all the professions, not just retrofit coordinator, but all the roles under past 2035, there's a need for more support there. And there's a need for new tools to be developed, which supports uh, those people to practice effectively. Um, and then really crucially, um, and this comes out a lot when I'm uh, engaging with many of the people who are on this call, whether it's by email or on LinkedIn or what have you, there's a need to connect the marketplace up and to bring the marketplace together, which is exactly why uh, the Retrofit Academy supported the Retrobook app. Um, which has been developed, which is still um, still a work in progress, it has to be said, but that's what that, that service is there to do. And it's one of the um, key aspects of the um, Retrofit Academy Center of Excellence. It's not, not an advert here, but um, I just wanna stress that on our first meeting, um, you might recall Tim Freeman um, uh, at the end uh, of the session sort of called for us to create something which brought the industry together um, and helped bridge that gap between theory and practice and that's exactly what we did um, over the following weeks in creating the Retrofit Academy Centre of Excellence um, to do the kind of things that you can see on screen there um, and um, we're very pleased we start, we, we've set that up and memberships now open uh, and lots of organizations on this call have already joined. You'll see who shortly actually. Um, so we've got lots of good support to, to mem both learners and to members of the Center of Excellence. Um, we've also started to, um, well, we've, we've gone a lot further. We've produced the PAS 2035 template documents, which, um, Again, on our previous call, our previous meeting, many coordinators said that was the big thing that they felt that was missing um, and it wasn't currently available through the schemes that they were joining. So uh, myself, Peter Rickaby, uh, Tim Martell, Lisa Pasquale, Alan Pitha, and others have all been contributing to the creation of these um, PAS 2035 templates. I was hoping to give you a video um, uh, view of these, but uh, it's, well, We'll see how it goes, but there's 45 minutes of stuff here. Um, but um, we've been demonstrating those to Trustmark and some of the accreditation schemes and the members, and the feedback's been really, really good on those. And as of today, our target date for launching these and making them available to coordinators was always the 1st of July, uh, and we've done that. So um, they are one of the primary benefits of membership of the centre. Um, I'm also really excited to tell you about two support programs that we're putting in place over the next three months um, and this is with the support of Bayes uh, well the funding support Bayes thanks to which to Andre and the departments and also uh, it's a move supported by Trustmark so the, the need to support um, retrofit coordinators in particular into effective practice um, and we've been looking at that problem for a long time we've got a strong faith in the retrofit coordinator qualification certainly in terms of introducing you to best practice theory um, but it was developed at a time when past 2035 was a work in progress and none of the actual tools of the trade existed um, now we will be building all this stuff retrofitting all that stuff if you like into the course but that will take time and many of you already completed the course as it was so over the next three months we'll be working with 75 retrofit coordinators, either current graduates or those who are near to graduating, and giving you a structured mentoring and support program, the intention of which is to get you practicing as a retrofit coordinator is supposed to do. Um, and it's not always yet clear to you what that means. So you will be very clear if you're involved in this process, you'll be very well supported into effective practice. Um, now that program is there to support coordinators, both um, independent coordinators and um, those who work for other, uh, for larger organisations, um, but it's primarily aimed at those people wanting to work in the eco sector or the large set, the large scale sector of the market. Um, so we will be in touch about that. But if you want to express an interest in it, 
just drop me an email or, or, or info at retrofitacademy.org uh, and we'll consider it. But we'll be in touch very shortly with lots of you about that. Um, a second programme that we'll be putting in place over the next three months is called Practitioners into Practice. Um, and this is responding to the need to get more experienced retrofit uh, design and construction professionals practicing as coordinators. So this is uh, what we will go out and find 25 exceptional candidates, bring them onto the level five program, and then try and bring them into the market so that there's a, a really good range of high quality professionals in addition to those we've already trained. Um, clearly we need more and more people. Um, so um, those are quite exciting developments for us uh, and for the and for you, I hope, and um, I'll, I'll be happy to take questions on them later. Uh, but it's time now for me to introduce uh, Simon Ayres, who's going to get us really excited, aren't you, Simon? Um, I hope about uh, about all things to do with Trustmark. So, if you would like to share your screen, yes, please, David. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to really talk a little bit about Trustmark, a little bit about where we're going. But there's, there's two themes for me today um, to talk around. One is the challenges that have come from prior delivery, um, some of the prior quality, and some of the, the sort of issues that we are still picking up today through that past history, um, which is all the negative. But on the positive, there is a really very, very great future that can be created and a future if we get the quality right and the compliance right, I think we'll see many of us probably through to retirement, well certainly me, um, way beyond those areas. I, I have a little bit of knowledge around eco in um, probably the PAS as well, so the PAS we've grown up with in the last few years. But I did work for a one of the big six, as was a number of years ago when Green Hill was launched. So um, I had a first hand experience of the probably competing nature of Green Deal to Eco in the delivery of Eco. Um, and I think that probably still exists today, unfortunately. So I've got a few slides I'm going to share. I'm not going to really bore you too long with slides. Hopefully. You should now have a, a Trustmark slide. Yep. Yes, it's there. The, um, I think it's probably worth then, so David quite nicely introduced Trustmark, talked about the data warehouse and some of the elements that came out of it. So the, the energy company obligation, um, and I'm sure everyone is aware, providing we get the quality right, providing we ensure that we are satisfying the need of whole house style approaches under PAS 2035 is being forecast to go through to 2028. Yeah, now I'm um, pretty sure also that it will change as we move forward and become multi-measure and have lots of variations. But uh, I think for me, it started to demonstrate if we can get the right quality, the right delivery, the right organizations within this sector delivering you know, the, the work that should be there. And there is a future around just eco on its own. The, the addition here that David talked around had been the data warehouse. So the data warehouse is up and running. Um, it is seeing lodgements. At the moment, we have just under 100,000 measures that have come through the system. Um, some of those measures are coming through under PAS 2035. And the audit and regime of uh, the 2035 areas are now starting to be looked at. So we are picking up some of those early challenges that we would expect through transition. We are also picking up some of the areas um, where I think, you know, as an industry, we must try harder to a degree, and we have to try to get some of those um, areas sorted out. And I think the addition of templates, the addition of all the, the support that will be coming along will make that a lot easier. Um, we also need to remember that on the data warehouse is the property hub. And the property hub will allow property owners to look at what's been done, when it was done, yeah, who did it, how it's protected. And that sort of access point will also start to become a key point for many other areas of industry and sectors. So the rental sector has become very interested in what we're doing with the data warehouse and the property hub, which means they are looking at things like 
whole house retrofit. They are looking at the outcomes of eco to see whether that can be applied in a much wider basis. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a great time to be thinking about the future and moving through the transition. Uh, we have probably a couple of bits here that are worth remembering um, why we're here. So we have 4.2 million households living in persistent poverty. This was pre-COVID, all right? Um, I don't know what the latest figures are, but I'm guessing they have increased considerably. Some people saying as much as 20 to 30%, um, which is really scary in a country that we are today. We have, at that point in time, 2.2 million households in fuel poverty. 71% of our households fall below C on an EPC rating. And if you start thinking about some of the initiatives that are being talked around, you know, you start converting that into the amount of work that has to be undertaken, it's vast. It's absolutely huge. Um, and we know the 2050 target, but we also have targets for 2035 to ban C. So there, there's a market, and um, we just now have to get that market nudged into action. We have the 2050 government target for net zero. Um, I think that is a challenging target in today's market with any doubts. Um, we had an announcement from the Prime Minister yesterday, very much looking at areas of, um, I would guess, sort of development around hospitals, schools, infrastructure. Um, we probably all have our fingers crossed that the Chancellor will announce something on his speech next week that will look at the, the energy efficiency areas and the carbon areas. Um, because a small injection of grants or funding could make a massive difference, a massive difference. Um, and that could be the trigger to really then start to drive a proper review and look at how 2035 whole house retrofit will fit in the future. We have 19 billion pounds a year spent on treating the effects of unhealthy homes. Um, wouldn't it be nice if we could divert you know, 18 billion of that towards what we have to do within our sectors and support our sectors to, to help it grow? So there are some massive opportunities to work with the NHS, you know, with lots of their associated functions to reduce their costs, but put more money into what we're doing. Um, I think the latest, there were 28.3 million homes in the UK. And out of that, and it's a number of Peters reminded me many times, 24 million will need retrofitting in the next 30 years. 17,000 homes a week. Yeah. Um, and if you put that into an average sort of cost for a retrofit, £425 million pounds worth of marketplace, yeah, £22 billion pounds per annum. There's a huge opportunity outside of ECO to look at where PAS 2035, whole house yeah, retrofit moving forward has a massive part to play. So I think the skeptics that are saying around the market, around the opportunity, probably need to look a little bit further afield and start thinking about the future as well. And we have this, and this is just to try to reflect how this comes together in the impact. So supply chain, consumer, and demand. Demand needs the nudge. The nudge um, could come from green financing. So um, everywhere you go at the moment, we've been on a, a webinar this morning that talks around where the Bank of England, the FCA, they are all now talking around green funding. How can we get really our sector to a point where retrofit can be funded through maybe equity release, it could be green mortgages, green loans, that will drive a marketplace and nudge that market and to really move to a point that David's been talking about, which is quality, you know, confidence in the market, confidence in the consumer, um, you know, understanding by the consumer. Again, it came up in a, a session at lunchtime today where um, somebody didn't really understand whole house retrofit. There was no really commonality of that. What does this really mean? Um, so we have, to, we have to build that confidence, that understanding. Through doing that, we develop training, we develop 
really the opportunity to grow our supply chains and create a really sustainable future. But this links to an awful lot of probably what we're seeing in the press at the moment about sustainability, job creation, business growth. Um, you know, we are in a, a really great place, even without government support, to look at what we do as an industry to now move forward. And I think that's massively important to get this sustainable future, even with the spelling mistake. Um, the market challenge, so there's a bit of a breakdown of EPCs on the left, and I think most of you will know that, but when you start looking at the challenge for those that are band E and above, um, you can probably understand why there's been some focus in terms of how do we get those to a band C, a band B. Um, some will love EPCs, some will hate EPCs, but the reality is it's a, a baseline that we have today. And then you start thinking about the challenge. So, you know, we've talked a bit net zero. We talked around, you know, the housing stock, the 24 million properties, the 300,000 homes a year that have to be built, and the supply chain that we can really put quality into, we can co put compliance into, we can create a supply chain, which actually, when we talk about something, there is a positive, really upbeat message about how that delivery is happening yeah, and it's happening at speed and with the right level of, of compliance. We should be looking at retraining. If there was ever an opportunity at the, you know, in any period of time to look at how we bring people in and look at transferable skills, how we bring them through academies, um, now is the opportunity. I think today alone, I'm sure you're all hearing the news where there are multiples of people being laid off today from multiples of organizations. Um, and that there's really great people that we could bring into our sector. And I think, you know, we, we're all looking for government to lead in terms of funding and new initiatives. Um, but in a way, the industry also and the sectors have also got to come up with really some solid and very, very deliverable ideas that we can go to government with. Um, we have to prove that what we're asking for can be delivered, delivered at quality, um, and we reduce any redress or any other areas that may come back. And um, the last one there is around behavioural change. Uh, you know, I guess being trained as a gas engineer too many years ago, um, working through the industry, working in the energy sector, working in the construction sector, it is a massive change we need to make. But I think it's a change which actually, if we start to move forward with, we think about what we're doing, there are some real benefits. And just to finish, because I'm sure David will cut me off if I've gone over my time anyway. Um, I, I asked myself three questions really, which was, would the implementation of PAS 2035 be easy? No, it wouldn't. It was never going to be. You know, we were introducing a new rigorous standard that supported a quality delivery yeah, and new working changed practices. However, as a consumer, my expectation would be if I am looking at outside of just where there is government initiatives and it's work that I'm paying for, that I am getting a service that picks up, you know, the whole house approach. I want something done to the right quality. I accept that things may go wrong from time to time but I want to be able to invest in my property with confidence. And we, we have to be able to demonstrate that across the market. Was the introduction, introduction of the PAS the right thing to do? Absolutely. You know, we've got net zero. The climate crisis hasn't gone away. It hasn't disappeared. Um, we still have to work towards a number of targets. We have to deliver quality. Um, but we also have this sustainable and focused supply chain that we need to build. Without the supply chain, we cannot deliver the retrofit requirements that are needed. So there is really great opportunity. And the last one is, why is the PAS introduction important? Well, I've answered two of those bits above, but the third one here is one of those unseen consequences. Through a lack of confidence, through some organizations, not delivering what they should have delivered. Things like solar PV, for instance, um, a lot of the financiers pulled out of the market. By pulling out of the market, they cut off part of yeah, the ability to fund and deliver work. 
that we have to build confidence back into that sector. Um, and that's being done through things like the Green Finance Institute, the work that we're doing with them. And I think the work that you're all doing by moving to PAS 2035 um, to demonstrate that we can reduce risk we can actually allow greater investment, which means that we can all see better times as we move forward. And I think, you know, all I would do is thank you all for listening to me for 10 minutes. Uh, really to, to wish all of you the, the best success in the transition as we go forward. Um, but remember that we are looking to the future, not necessarily looking to the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. Um, it's always weird presenting and not getting a round of applause at the end, isn't it? But they're all clapping at home. You just can't hear them. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it okay uh, to throw a couple of questions at you, Simon, or, or do, are you needed somewhere else immediately? I'm always needed, but I'm happy to take questions. Okay. Um, well, what I'm going to do, I've, I have one question here that's been put through the chat. Um, it, I don't know if it's one for you or Phil, really, um, but um, it, it, it's a question from Peter Draper, and he's asked, how many PAS 2030 installers are now coming through the Trustmark system? So how many do you have registered as we speak? Uh, you're talking about uh, PAS 2030 installers? That's what the question asks, yeah. yes. Uh, I think we have somewhere in the re in excess of 300 PAS 2030 installers. I haven't checked the exact number in the last few days, but actively as well, somewhere in the region between sort of, uh, three and 400 installers. Okay, and do you know what that is as a proportion of the overall, Phil, just to give it some context? Um, we think we think there's a number of PAS 2030 installers that sits at somewhere just over 900. So, so we're approaching the sort of midpoint of people practicing. Now, some of those will be subcontractors of the people that are lodging. Um, and because I'm, I'm not convinced there's a huge community of past 2030 installers that aren't participating in ECAP. So currently it looks like a, approaching 50%, but that could be a number of reasons because the way that we look at things are the way that people are actively lodging as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the active lodgements will probably be coming through the main contractor. So that's probably where there's a, a, a sort of a difference in numbers. Okay, there you go. Andre's just ch chipped in. 321 businesses lodging on ECO. So those numbers are in line. Um, I think one for for uh, Simon uh, is from, um, now I've been dreading this, I think it's a lady asking this question because I have no idea how to pronounce your name. Savenya, I think. Um, uh, she's a trainee retrofit coordinator. Um, she says, it's good to see a holistic approach to retrofitting. One challenge I see is ensuring that contractors deliver a quality service. Uh, how do you think we can ensure this will happen? And so what we're doing is Trustmark is now really also plugging into the supply chain to look at how um, through probably the, the transition of eco and the delivery of the, the measures through the new past 2035 areas, we can build a supply chain that also meets. Um, and it's probably worth saying as well that governments also recognize that the supply chain is an essential part of this process. So um, I think we will see all sorts of opportunities coming along very shortly to support installers delivering quality, supported by PAS 2035, yeah, um, retrofit coordinators, retrofit assessors, and actually really a, a, a property, regardless of tenure, being treated as it should be. Okay, fantastic. And so uh, one final question uh, from David O'Neill, um, who is a retrofit coordinator, and he asks, what measures are being taken to get more people into the uh, associated trades? It's a great question, actually, because associated trades, I think, as we move forward, will change as well. I think the traditional trades that we talk around today could become more sort of reliant upon sustainable style measures and multi-measure areas. Um, but we are, what we're working with is with all the schemes, we have 42 scheme providers. We're working with those schemes at how we support them to bring people in. But also we're talking to people like the um, different catapults around the country, uh, the different probably training and development edu sort of centers to ensure that we're building a supply chain that will support everybody in this process. Okay. 
Thank you very much. I think what I took from your words today, Simon, more than anything else, is that we might think, if we're in the industry, we might think this is a very challenging and difficult time, and I'm sure it is for all sorts of reasons. But actually, what you're describing is quite an exciting time too, isn't it? So um, thank you very much for that. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, we'll move on now uh, to hear from uh, Adrian Wright. I'm hoping you're there, Adrian. I haven't actually seen you yet. There you are. Great. Um, just bear with me one second. Um, okay, and apologies. A number of you have let me know that you weren't able to see my presentation properly before, so I'm hoping you now are. Um, just to introduce Adrian, uh, many of you will know him. Uh, he's the um, chief executive of the um, of, of Happy Energy, a uh, an installer and managing agent who are based down in Cornwall, but very active across the UK and especially in London. Um, Adrian is the chair of um, the Centre of Excellence Eco Working Group. Um, which has uh, met twice over the last couple of weeks. It's the first of our working groups to get moving and uh, Adrian's been a really key figure in, in helping pull all this together. You can see on screen there the, um, the current members of that group. Um, it's brilliant that we've got a range of, um, some, of the, some of the bigger installers who are facing, most of whom are facing the, the challenge of transition to 2019 now. Um, we've also recently started working with a number of the accreditation schemes who've joined, uh, Elmhurst, Stroma and uh, the IAA, which some of you uh, may still think of as SEGA, but Nigel will tell you um, it's uh, now the Insulation Assurance Authority. Um, uh, and we're also really pleased that having formed that group, we've also got buy-in to it from, uh, from Bayes and Trustmark and Ofgem and UCAS and through Peter's involvement, we also have a link into BSI. So um, that's become a very sort of rounded group, um, which has started doing some interesting things. So uh, Adrian is gonna tell us about it. Um, do you have, do you want to share your I screen, am. Adrian? I will do, yeah. Thank you. Brilliant. Is that coming through okay? Mm, yes, yeah. it is. Um, so really good to hear uh, Simon talking about the importance of the supply chain uh, for eco. Um, I think you know, to some extent the eco installers have kind of got a bit of a, a bad rap over the years and there's a, a lot of eco installers that are trying to do the right thing, uh, kind of move to the to the new paths. I was quite astonished to, to hear 320, um, Bill, is that right? About 320 installers have now gone over to 2019. Uh, um, no, a practicing a, a practicing PAS installers, not necessarily gone over a uh, one level or another. Okay, be interesting to know how many are, are twenty nineteen. That'd be quite an interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, interesting point. Point. No. Thank you. Um, so, um, yes, David said the uh, Centre of Excellence was established to, to try and support the supply chain, and within that, um, I think there was a, a, a key group of um, organisations that are identified as requiring some support. Um, so the, uh, the the working group was formed, initially had a different name, but it's eventually kind of uh, formed into the eco working group. I think that's because predominantly the organizations that are working in the industry um, are linked to eco or PAS. So I'm just gonna give you um, a bit of a background about um, how the group was formed, uh, what we've been trying to do, and what we're looking to do for the future. So, I mean, you're all aware uh, the changes that happened uh, in ECO, the involvement in uh, with Trustmark coming in in sort of January, um, new lodgements via the data warehouse. So this was a, a change to the to the normal way of doing things through um, energy suppliers into Ofgem. Uh, there are new requirements for insurance back guarantees. Um, installers and energy suppliers have had to set up a lot of new systems. So it's been a, a quite a significant change for the industry, even for those that are still working to 2017. It was kind of almost like turning the industry on its head. Then uh, those companies that uh, became accredited for past 2030, 2019, uh, a lot of the accreditation uh, bodies weren't able to certify until sort of February, March time, some more recently. So um, a number of installers, ourselves included, and a number of the members on the, on the group that David have talked about um, have moved over to the new PAS. And uh, we're looking to um, complete the full PAS 2035 journey. So the whole house approach, 
uh, implementing the rhetoric coordinator role to completely project manage that from from end to end and i think it was identified by trustmark by the rhetoric academy probably by ofgem the energy suppliers that the companies that were moving in trying to implement the new standard needed some level of support uh, some guidance uh, and it wasn't entirely obvious who you would go to to ask those questions there are also requirements for new qualifications uh, and new uh, specifically qualified retrofit designers so those architect rick surveyors that had the additional qualifications that were required for uh, predominantly pass c but also uh, certain elements of path b and how do you find these people where are they uh, certain qualifications where do you go to get those so there were lots of questions um, that that lots of companies were asking um, all over the place. Um, there's a number of stakeholders involved in, in ECO now. It used to be quite straightforward. You had your installer, you had a contract with a managing agent or an energy supplier. The energy supplier would lodge the, uh, the information or bank the information with Ofgem. It was sort of reasonably straightforward. Now, with the, the new world, particularly with the um, 2035 world, you have lots of other stakeholders. Uh, you know, BSI were always there with, with the PAS standard. Now you have more involvement with the accreditation bodies. So they were involved in the past uh, when EPCs were involved with ECO, but um, once they kind of moved out, uh, once the, the Dean scores came in, they had sort of less involvement in ECO, but they're now a really key organization. Uh, you've still got the installers there, technical monitoring companies, bays, uh, software providers, but now you've also got retrofit coordinators and they don't always necessarily work for the, the company. They can be independent, but from an installer perspective, that retrofit coordinator and their ability to uh, be fully compliant and to ensure that everything's done properly um, is the difference between them getting paid for that job and not getting paid for that job. Um, and Trustmark obviously got a, a major uh, role in this, but you know, the past 2030 is not their standard. Yeah, they know a lot about it, but they're not necessarily the, the, the people that you should be going to. The Retrofit Academy, you know, most of the people on the call have been through the Retrofit Academy's courses for Retrofit uh, Coordinator, one of the courses from the accreditation body is a Retrofit Assessor. But you know, their, their role is, is to, to provide the courses, they're not necessarily there to um, provide the guidance. And Ofgem are potentially now even more, <coughs> even more hands off um in terms of this process and they were before because they're relying on trustmark and the accreditation bodies to to get the information right to get it lodged and then effectively they just look at the number uh, and from their point of view to some extent that's you know that's enough of that measure to be compliant so you have all of these organizations um you know particularly for installers they're out there saying okay we've, you know we're, we're trying to implement the PAS. we really want to do the right thing not just necessarily because of the uplift, but because they see the future that you know, Simon painted in terms of um, additional funding that might be coming down the line and the and the, the able to pay market if we can ever get that going. So, you know, am I doing the right thing? Who do I need to speak to? Who's responsible for that part? And what happens if if I do this? There was no real kind of organisation that uh, that tied those different things together, those different stakeholders. So. Um, yeah, I think lots of people have been having conversations, Trustmark and Retrofit Academy, we've been uh, talking to those organisations as well. Um, and through some of the conversations we had with David, um, I think he, you know, I'd like to thank David for kind of stepping up and the Retrofit Academy for stepping up to say, we're not exactly sure who the person should be that, that, that acts as the glue between all these organisations. Um, but, you know, we would be willing to, to create something. And that was the the essence of the center of excellence that was created uh, that we're now members of and a number of organizations on the call are, are now members of and uh, the idea of the group uh, was to try and find out what the key challenges were uh, for the industry you know what what things need to be clarified uh, what kind of guidance is needed and, and how can we uh, help these organizations to work together to deliver the new powers uh, and make it a success who do we need around the table so you know, the first group started off with you know, maybe 10 or 11 organizations and uh, future meetings have, um, have added additional people. Um, you know, Trustmark on long base, uh, we had UCAS at the last meeting. So it's getting all the people around the table so that uh, decisions can be made and everyone's points of view can be um, discussed um, and you know, potentially looking to, to expand that group 
Um, but, but most importantly, what can be done to help? You know, how can the group help? We don't necessarily have all the answers, but you know, if, there's, if there's a barrier, if there's something that needs clarifying, let's try and get it sorted so that we can uh, move on. So current members, uh, David's kind of run through the, the specific uh, organisations, but um, it's you know, pretty much uh, or several people from the, the academy team, uh, Trustmark, uh, there's several installers on there, Atma uh, represented uh, by Beers on, on the group, by Neil. Uh, eco software providers are on there, obviously they're fairly key in terms of helping to um, oil the wheels of the different organisations that work in eco. Um, accreditation bodies, and so Nigel, IA, uh, sort of SEGA has, has uh, joined up and I'm sure other ones will, will join up as well. Uh, I mentioned UCAS joined the group and Ofgem and Bayes will be joining the group soon. So, you know, it's becoming a, you know, the eco working group is becoming an excellent group for um, trying to uh, get some action in terms of delivering PaaS successfully. So the key challenges that were identified um, early on were uh, guidance around ventilation. And uh, Peter or Rickaby will um, frequently say it was ventilation was always in PaaS and it, you know, it's, it's always been there. Uh, but I think the, the extent and the level of ventilation that's in the, the new PaaS and particularly the requirements of 2035 have really strengthened the requirement for, for ventilation. Um, and that threw up a lot of questions. There seem to be um, a lot of questions flying around. You know, when, when do you have to do an assessment? Uh, exactly what works uh, are required? How do you identify um, you know, the existing uh, air permeability of the property? Um, do you need to do air pressure tests? There was a, a huge amount of questions that um, Lisa Pasquale from the Academy uh, did some fantastic work supported by uh, some of the other people, including Peter, to get some guidance out. And that, that's now available, um, I believe, for members of the, of the Centre of Excellence. Uh, standard templates. You know, the past, the past, you, know, you can go to the, the 2035 and you can read whatever the page number is. I should know the page numbers off by heart by now. Uh, but it will list all of the different things that your document should have when you supply it to the customer in terms of energy savings, CO2 savings, um, how you uh, display the cost for those works. Whilst all that's there, there was no kind of off-the-shelf uh, document, which is, is fairly consistent really with how ECO started in 2013 when there were no standard documents and we worked with Ofgem uh, and other installers and sort of created the, it used to be called the Simplification Group, now it's kind of the ECO Working Group with Ofgem, to create the standard set of documents so that it just simplifies it for everyone. Uh, and Tim, uh, Tim from the group, Tim Martel, has done an amazing job with uh, a spreadsheet and some clever programming, uh, which enables you to, to carry out the risk assessment for the works, so you know what path you're going down, but it also then produces effectively all you need uh, to lodge uh, Trustmark. So um, if you haven't already seen that, um, then I suggest you, you, you join the group and get a hold of it because it's a, a real um, time saver. Excellent piece of work, Tim. Um, and then course provision, coordination. So uh, a huge sort of, um, sticking point that's uh, particularly because of COVID and the lockdown is the ability to actually get some of the qualifications that are required. So for listed buildings, uh, there's a specific level three qualification that's required. Um, and through through the group and through David and the, uh, the, the academy, uh, we've been able to, to coordinate um, not only trying to get some course dates in for assessors who are going to pretty much all going to need this, uh, but actually kind of getting it moved into an online course from August, uh, which will mean more people can get trained uh, more quickly and more easily uh, without having to travel uh, and with social distancing. Uh, and signposting to qualified designers. So again, David mentioned that um, as part of the, the, the funding package that uh, they've just uh, been successful in, in receiving, um, it's, it's quite key to get some of these designers, um, architects, RICS people involved in, in the industry. It's quite difficult as an individual installer to, to go out and try and find an architect or a RICS surveyor and say, oh, do you know anything about eco? And will you, you know, will you have a look at this design? Will you help them? You know, and, and for them to fully understand and, and um, look at what the risk might be from them and for their PI insurance. So by bringing more of these organisations in, it helps to kind of spread the word through, through those uh, organisations and helps signpost to, to us as installers who we can go to, to to get the support because it's all new. Yeah, it's not something we've had to do in the past. So, um, so finally, what next with the Eco Working Group? Um, 
uh, you know, David indicated that it's, it's relatively new. It's just met a couple of times. I think possibly three, if I remember rightly. Um, you know, the, the plan is to continue trying to identify any of these um, barriers, looking at what we can do to, to overcome them, uh, continue to uh, maintain that dialogue between all the organisations that we've listed uh, previously and to, and to ensure that everyone's kind of working together. Everyone understands everyone else's point of view uh, and, you know, try and be sort of pragmatic in, in terms of being able to, to get a, a a, work, a workable transition and delivery of, of the new powers. Um, yeah, there's a lot of questions flying around. I think yeah, the senior organisations learn that through the centre of excellence, they can funnel these, these questions in. So you're not constantly reinventing the wheel in terms of the questions that are being asked and the questions that are being answered and, and information flying around. Uh, all that information can uh, come through the, uh, the centre of excellence. It can be disseminated out, so you know, through newsletters and websites. So it just kind of it, it stops people having to fly around. Hopefully, it'll be less work for uh, people at Trustmark and the accreditation body. It'll be sort of less questions for them and sort of less pressure on their teams as well. I mentioned before, you know, we want a, a smooth transition. Uh, we are working to encourage more companies who are 2017 to to move over and start delivering to 2019. Uh, and to do that, we need a, a smooth transition. You know, and we're sort of working together as a group to try and make sure that happens. Uh, and lastly, sort of aiming to reduce the risk for all parties. So um, yeah, I've mentioned energy suppliers. There are none on the group yet, but you know, I'm sure you know, we'd, we'd like to invite them onto the group because they're, yeah, they're the people that hold the, the purse strings in ECO. They're, they're one of the key organisations. And for them, you know, they're trying to understand the risk as well. They're trying to understand what happens if a, a retrofit coordinator has forgotten to say that the property is in a, a, you know, is a listed building. So perhaps they've gone down the wrong path. You know, not, not path path, but you know, in terms of the using the right designer, um, you know, will that mean that that work will be revoked from off gem? And so, th so they're trying to understand the risks uh, and understand the, the process. So, uh, if we can bring them into into the group as well, uh, we can reduce their risk. Uh, we can reduce the risk on the installers of, of having clawbacks uh, and potentially the risk of retrofit coordinators inadvertently doing the wrong thing. Uh, and, and being unable to continue acting as a, as a coordinator. So, you know, there's, there's lots more work to do, uh, but I think, you know, it's really positive that the, the group's been formed um, by the Retrofit Academy, um, and we're looking forward to doing some, some, more, some more work to help installers and, and the rest of the supply chain. Um, so that was it. Uh, so just a, a, a plug uh, for, for those organisations who haven't yet joined the Centre of Excellence, um, as, as we and the other members have to, to join uh, and there's the website address um, and then I don't know if anyone has any questions. Thank you very much Adrian. Um, I've had questions come through on the chat. Um, it's probably a good idea if it's okay Adrian, just to, to move us on. If, if Would you mind joining the panel sure. that we're going to do uh, now because you'll be well placed to answer some of the some of the questions. Okay. Um, but uh, and, and uh, thank you for the plug for the centre there. Um, I've Later in the presentation there's a the, link is repeated if you missed it there. Um, so we'll, we'll move on to uh, question time now, I think. Um, so back to me. Okay. So, okay, question time, our panel, um, which we're also going to put Adrian on the, on the end of there. But um, this is the same panel we had for our first meeting because they were just so good. We decided we couldn't improve upon it. So um, we have Andre Miller, who uh, is in charge of ECO at Bayes. He's also been promoted recently, um, so he's, uh, he's even more important than he was last time we met him. Um, Dr. Peter Rickaby, uh, most of you will know by now, there was a time where the numbers 2035 didn't mean that much to Peter, but um, oh. it now uh, has taken over his life somewhat, I suspect. Uh, Phil Mason, uh, Head of Compliance from Trustmark, and Nigel Donahue, the Chief Executive of the Insulation Assurance Authority. I got it right. Yes, brilliant. Um, so we split this into uh, three sections. Uh, the first one is uh, what we advertise the event as, really. So these are questions that related to PAS and the ECO. Um, I, uh, it's all about how we put the standard into practice in this sector specifically. Uh, and it is, of course, the biggest market sector by far. So if all of the panelists could unmute their microphones now, um, I, I will ask the question on behalf of the, the group and then I'll, I'll point it in someone's direction. But if any of you, the others want to comment on it, uh, we can do. Uh, this one, I'm going to throw at Andre um, because 
I'm not sure anyone else knows the answer at the minute yet. Um, uh, how are the energy companies dealing with all this so far? Um, asked Gary Bosher from Energy Specifics. Ah, yes, I was, I was, uh, when I saw that question before, uh, I was hoping I wouldn't have to answer it. Sorry. It's, <laughs> it's quite a, quite a tough one, really. I mean, they, they, overall energy companies were enthusiastic about, um, about an improvement in standards. So theoretically, they've always backed, uh, PAS 2035 and the new PAS is an imp improvement in, in standards and all the things that people have talked about so far today. Um, I, I think just as always, and, and as some of the other questions uh, allude to or, or point to very firmly, they are, they are mainly concerned about delivering things at lowest cost initially. But I think they do, they do have that, and I can appreciate this even with what's happening within Bayes. You know, there's, on the one hand, we want to deliver retrofit uh, cost effectively and some people will translate that as cheaply as possible uh, on the other hand recognize the risks of not doing it properly and I think the energy companies probably have that dilemma even more so and and their budgets are uh, being scrutinized and um, so so what we what we hear back from them is very similar to what we hear from installation companies because they they hear the the problems being reported by the people they they are contracting with and that is that um the 20 percent uplift is it doesn't cover the extra costs um and and therefore you know they are worried about how much it's going to cost to deliver deliver the the, the bill savings that they need to deliver and just to give you context you know in, in the past few iterations of ECO, we've estimated a certain level of uh, pence per, um, per carbon saved or uh, LBS saved, and they have generally delivered well below that. Whereas this time, um, we are very close to the, the wire. So the 640 million is predicated on a certain number, um, and uh, we it, it's getting to the point where suppliers are finally having to pay that that number. Um, so it's you know over it's over prices are around 30p per per LBS, whereas um, they started out in Eco3 around 20p initially, I think. Um, so the prices are rising. So that is a that is a big concern for them, especially in the current environment where their balance sheets are being squeezed. Um, so, so uh, to summarise, it, it, it is for them. They need to minimise costs, but overall, you know, in theory, they do want to support this move to better standards because they don't want to be policing standards. Okay, thank you. I thought you coped with that extremely well, Andre. Um, three of the energy companies did register for this event. I'm, I'm not sure if they uh, if they actually made it onto the call or not, but that was that was encouraging. Um, as is the recent recently, a number of them have signed up for the coordinator course too. So hopefully they're getting on with it, and um, we'd like to work with them through the through the centre of excellence moving forwards too. I'm going to whiz on because we've got so many questions to get through. Um, so um, Lee Fairbrother from Qbot asks if ECO can adequately fund PAS 2035, which Andre just mentioned there. And he asked, will there be a significant shortfall for many homes? Um, that's one I'm going to point towards uh, Phil Mason, I think. Um, I think in the, in the conversations that we've had and the ones that are going, ongoing, it's recognised that the cost of oh. delivery, um, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it, it's been, um, uh, the, the additional costs have been were published in the base consultation on the um, impact and the financial impact analysis that has been produced by the economists. But I, I think what has to be recognised is there is an additional cost as published in the impact analysis um, in order to manage quality. Uh, and I, I think as we start to go forward, I think they probably need, and, and I, I'm open for somebody to disagree here as well. I think we probably need to start considering now that the cost of quality delivery and the steps to change and it will will cost a bit more so it will cost more to deliver measures um, to deliver the quality behind it but you could always say there's a cost and, and it's easier and it's 
it's less easier to put a number to this directly in a question like that, that there's a cost of, 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 of not working to the powers and there's a, qual a cost of, of, of uh, non-quality delivery. Indeed. Nigel, do you have a view on this one? Uh, the only thing I'd say that the limitation is obviously the, the, the current construct of ECO, so it wasn't naturally designed as a whole house retrofit um, scheme. So we have got a tendency to look to deploy single measures. We've got some volume limitations around certain measures, things like solid wall. Um, so that is always going to be a challenge. Um, and the cost of compliance, to Andre's earlier point, I guess, the cost of compliance for single measures like loft is at, is at the moment quite prohibitive. So it may mean that some conscious decisions are taken around their measures unless um, the energy suppliers look to fund that at a higher rate. So yeah. It's not going to be without its challenges. Um, it's it's planning for the future, and it's probably not fully aligned to the current construct of the eco scheme. Okay, so clearly, getting the uh, the next round of eco from twenty twenty two aligned is a really big challenge for us all. Okay, thank you, uh, Martin Lennox, uh, a retrofit coordinator in training, asks: uh, Is the difference between the available eco funding for single measures and the whole house approach of PAS twenty thirty five going to help or hinder one another? Nigel, you've just touched upon this. I don't know if there's any additional points to make. I'd like to bring Peter in on that one too. Do you want to go ahead, Nigel, or shall I go first? I'll let you go first, Peter. Okay. Well, um, I think it's just there is a misfit. You know, um, Plus 35 is predicated on the idea that with several measures at once and packages, it's very difficult to, to um, five pieces of measure. So um, I think that what Passage 35 does is it um, in Okay. Uh, are other people struggling to hear Peter? Yep. Yes, everyone is. Peter, I'm very sorry, but we're, we're only picking up every few words. I'm going to bring Nigel in on that point and hope that your signal improves. I think I could, I'll have a stab at what, what I think Peter was going to, going to be saying anyway, and that is and, and, and my, my, my personal view. And that is um, PAS 2035, PAS 2030, as it's constructed now, whilst it's not fully aligned to ECOR, it provides the the footwork for the whole house retrofit. So even if you're limited by the measures you can install, um, actually the, the approach to assessment, the approach to design, um, and the optimization of the measures for the property helps for the future. So whatever comes along behind it will enable us to have a very good view of what the property needs and actually how their measures are going to stick with the work Yeah. Okay. So it strikes me we need a very practical plan around the current eco and making it work as best we can within its current constraints. Uh, Andre, any view on this? Yes, um, and it sort of ties into the previous question. Mm. Um, probably the answer is no if, to, to the, the previous question from my perspective. And the reason being that eco was designed uh, before we knew what the PAS 2035 would look like, um, the current iteration of ECO came in, you know, uh, December 2018, but actually the impact assessment and all of that was done based on evidence much earlier. So, so we didn't know how much extra cost it was going to add. And, and once we, we revised the, the ECO, we, it, in order to take those costs fully into account, we probably would have want, needed to reduce the uh, target in order to keep to our spending envelope um, which we were we didn't want to do obviously so so I appreciate that there are there are particularly as Nigel mentions the single measures um, it, it doesn't necessarily work in the current eco scheme um, but just to say and I think ho hopefully this this goes to, to some of the other questions uh, as well so I absolutely recognize that eco is not the right uh, mechanism to bring in PAS 2035 and that might be sort of in one, one sense quite dispiriting because I, I absolutely applaud those of you who've taken that step and are trying to move to it and training so absolutely well done we didn't have any other vehicle um, and so eco is is a first step and um, we there 
I'm convinced there will be other other policies, hopefully announced quite soon. You know, we had the the manifesto, and and hopefully we get further details on that in the in the coming uh, week or weeks. And and therefore, you know, eco is just is is something that was there. We wanted to set the message that this is the this is the way what we're moving towards. But then we can use other policies. Um, to encourage this further and move move a greater portion of the market over to to this market to, over to the PAS 2035. Okay, it's, it's so, absolutely imperfect at the moment, but it's a <laughs> first step, and, and we need okay. to start moving that way. We'll, uh, we'll we'll make the very best of it we can. Okay, let's move on. Oh, I think we've just covered that one in detail. Um, uh, and and Andre, well, sorry, somebody earlier certainly said that the current 20% uplift is unlikely to cover the full cost of compliance effectively. So I think we have already answered that. Um, unless there's any other country view, we'll move on. Um, th this is a, a good question from Jazz Azam. Um, so we, we're never, I'm never quite sure of the full extent of the eco industry, which is what Jazz is clearly part of, um, and to what extent it is aware of all of this we, we we're very we we do calls like this and the people that we train it's a relatively small number of people um so it's a good question what 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 is being done to promote the new standards in the wider industry um jazz says that the the sort of roles and the powers are, are not familiar to many of the partners that he works with um let's point now i think nigel who's done a lot to to, to do exactly this quite like yeah i mean so I was just going to say we, we started, um, we're obviously involved and heavily on the PAS 2035 and the PAS 2030 steering groups and, and conducted quite a, a, a lengthy exercise um, up and down the country, brief an hour, install the members, the then SEGA members on what was coming up, coming down the road and running some um, seminars and, and, and basically PAS training sessions. Yeah. Um, with all these things until it actually hits you, um, you know, people are, people are focused on delivering and, and they're focused on the day to day. So it's not always effective. You don't always get the right people in the room at the right time. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there are still surprises that are come to people that shouldn't, shouldn't be surprises. There's still that, um, and it's improving, but that lack of detailed understanding of what's happening under PAS 2035 of, of the various risks and, and the tools that the Retrofit Academy are, are producing are, are fantastic to help people understand and make sure they have got the, the right risk asso associated with the measure. Um, but, Despite, you know, I still think there's an awful lot to do to make sure people are fully aware. And I still have calls every day from energy suppliers asking me questions that, you know, this far down the road, you know, they're still trying to get clear in their own minds as to what the appropriate route is to a guarantee, what the compliance regime is, and what they need for a certain measure and what risk a certain measure sits in. So, yeah, yeah, there's still a lot to do. Okay, so just to, to the rest of the panel, who just asked, do we think that there is a significant proportion of the industry which is essentially totally unaware or has its head stuck in the sand? Phil Mason. Ah, I knew that might be coming my way. Sorry. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't use the term head in its stuck in the sand um, in quite that way. Uh, I sense um, from the number of telephone calls that I have with industry. Um, and my telephone starts to ring on some days just before six and, <laughs> and, and finishes ringing at some, some time just before 11. It's my choice whether I answer it. Uh, and occasionally I do. But by the volume of calls that come through, I think there are people that aren't sticking their head in the sand. But if, if I was honest, I think there's a possibility um, that their business plans may not have taken into account um, PAS being published a year ago. Uh, the fact that the legislation uh, uh, was enacted on the 1st of January and some of the conversations that I've had haven't, haven't really acknowledged those changes and the changes that are required by the Trustmark rules. So I think it, there, there's inertia um, rather than head sticking in the sand, but it, I think it's events like these and the spin-off conversations that come out from what I can see looks like 123 people uh, sat listening or participating in some other way uh, that, that start to drive that we need to look around us sort of approach more now um, and engage in, in, in engaging more conversation and you know who you are that phones me just before six in the morning as well 
<laughs> okay, we will be sharing this uh, video uh, and we'll put it up on, on LinkedIn and our social media channels. So it, it, it would be a great thing if everyone on the call were to share that post with five other people who you don't think are yet on the ball with this, then that will really help um, get the message out. Okay, now I'm hoping Peter's reconnected because this has got his favorite V word in it. What are the ventilation requirements under the eco for which I'm not sure that's quite the right question. I think it, it's under PAS 2035 because we're saying that in the eco PAS 2035 will apply and it's its requirements around ventilation that apply. So is Peter there? Yep, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Good. Okay, well, let's hope it stays that way. Um, you're right, it's PAS 2035 that sets the ventilation requirements. They were previously in PAS 2030, 2017, and they've been uh, enhanced a bit into 2035. And it's only because of Trustmark replying, co requiring compliance of ECO with PAS 2035 that the ventilation requirements come into place. Um, it's very hard to sum summarize them very quickly, but simply... <laughs> Uh, the idea is based on the maxim that's been long out there in the uh, retrofit industry, um, the deep retrofit industry, which is no insulation without ventilation. Uh, and that's based on the point that when you put insulation anywhere in the building envelope or you do air tightness measures, you reduce the infiltration rate. And in doing so, you're reducing the internal air quality. And we may need to replace the lost infiltration with more deliberate ventilation uh, to guarantee that the air quality is good enough. So essentially what PAS 2035 asks us to do, if we are proposing to add insulation or air tightness measures to the dwelling, to assess the existing ventilation, to make sure that there is a ventilation system, there may not be, or it may be not functional, or it may not be complete, and um, assess on those kind of terms whether or not it's adequate for the dwelling as it will be after the retrofit measures have been installed, the insulation air tightness. If the assessment, which is defined in Annex C of PAS 2035, suggests that the ventilation system as it exists will be inadequate, then there are some requirements for um, making the ventilation system adequate or upgrading it. And they fall into two levels. One is if the air permeability of the dwelling after retrofit is likely to be more than five, then a very conventional intermittent extract ventilation system of fans in the wet rooms and trickle vents in the rest of the dwelling um, is what's required. Uh, very similar to the sort of thing that approved document F of the building regs asks for. If the air tightness of the building is going to be or likely to be lower than an air permeability of five or an air permeability lower than five after retrofit, then PAS 2035 asks for continuous ventilation so it's a slightly different technology, but one that's already very familiar in the new build sector because most house builders are building homes with air permeability lower than five and putting in uh, continuous, um, what's called decentralized mechanical extract ventilation. So PAS 2035 offers about three or four op op options for the ventilation upgrade. There are one or two uh, complications arising to do with knowing whether you're gonna be above or below that magic number of five. Uh, Lisa's been working on that for us with the guidance. Uh, we tried very hard to keep it simple and not require everybody to do pressure tests of everything because that would be a little bit onerous. Um, but I think the simplicity is slightly catching us out. But there are some sort of safe workarounds uh, that we're beginning to, well, we have identified and Lisa's building those into the guidance. I think that's probably enough on that one. That's, that's an excellent answer. Um, I'd just like to, um, we talk about the cost of compliance and ventilation being a cost of compliance. In effect, it's, it's essentially a new uh, service that the eco industry is going to have to deliver to customers who don't necessarily understand uh, why they should pay for it. Um, Adrian, I don't know if you have any uh, sort of um, view on that and the challenges that we face there in selling it to householders. Yeah, so... Probably, I'd just like to pick up on the last question about um, sort of disseminating the information out to, to the supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just pick up on that one first. So I think it's one of the other questions is, is, is and, and sort of are the people that are in the supply chain in certain sec sections the right people for delivering the new paths? So I think the, the, the kind of the world of eco is driven through a lot of the lead generators, the sort of the door knockers, yeah. who won't necessarily make very good retrofit assessors 
uh, and certainly probably won't make very good retrofit coordinators. So I think there's, um, there's a bit of a challenge for the industry in people moving and expecting the organisations that they typically work with to be able to continue delivering those services for them. So I think, I think that the, the whole house approach um, and the multi-measure approach uh, does, it, I think it will naturally, you know, some of the organisations that perhaps don't know about it are perhaps the ones that probably don't, aren't going to need to know about it because they're probably not going to be the right organisations to, um, to actually deliver. You can't just knock on the door and, and confirm whether it's suitable for multi-measures in, in one hit. Yeah. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of ventilation, yes, it's quite expensive. I think uh, it's been quite helpful with, um, with the group in particular with Lisa and Peter and their advice on what we can do as workarounds at the moment for those homes where we can't identify the existing air permeability. So uh, the use of what are potentially sort of relatively low cost DME B vans, fans uh, with some vent, uh, with some sort of trickle vents. Um, you know, I think all the installers are sort of finding it a little bit of a challenge uh, trying to tackle with uh, consumers um, ad adding ventilation when I've sort of used, used the analogy before, you know, we all in the 70s and 80s had the, the snake by the door and, you know, we spent years in he's screwing brushes on the bottoms of doors to stop drafts. And now we're taking them off and, and cutting the doors down and drilling holes in windows. So um, I think, I mean, our, you know, some installers experience is, is that, that that is a challenge. Uh, we've done some sort of surveys of customers that were in our pipeline and, and generally it doesn't seem to be much of a problem at the moment there's a few people that said they just wouldn't have any of it which obviously means they can't have the work um, but I think it's 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 going to be interesting when we actually get get down to it uh, actually sort of getting into people's homes um, you know trimming the doors installing the ventilation uh, just just how um, many jobs sort of fall by the wayside uh, not necessarily because of the cost, M might be the cost if there's not enough funding there, but also just the, the acceptance. So uh, as part of the uh, the Eco Working Group at the last meeting, we agreed to, uh, well, the Retrofit Academy possibly agreed uh, to, to put together some, some guidance that can go out to consumers and customers that explains the benefits of why we're looking for it. I'm yeah, sure David we, volunteered or not. We agreed. We agreed with need, and we didn't agree to do it. But it's um, it's one of the problems we're going to be looking at um, soon. So just just a simple guidance about what the benefits of the ventilation are. Yeah, uh, and there's there's all sorts of stories out about overheating and things. So. Okay, that's great. We, as I say, we've got lots to cover, so um, I'm going to move on. Thank you, and thanks for all the questions coming in by chat. I am reading them, and I will put them at the appropriate time. Um, uh, this is one specifically for Nigel. Um, because it relates to organisations you're involved in. Uh, SIGA uh, is the old name for the ins uh, Installational Assurance Authority. Um, so what are you doing differently uh, this time around, Nigel? Okay, um, I'm assuming this is aimed at the inherent technical risk, but well, I may be wrong. So um, the, the PAS does allow that um, where certain things are in place, the um, inherent technical risk of a measure um, can be reduced by one. Um, so to address that point firstly, um, that is a, an overall wraparound system, consider it as being PAS 2030 plus and all of the consumer protection, a link to a very specific system and audits and checks on system designers and their processes. There's a whole lot that goes together to provide that risk and that's why that, uh, provide that assessment and that's why that risk is allowed to be okay. but In terms of the wider thing, the IAA part of it, um, the end-to-end -end offer for us and, it, and it, it helps us understand what's happening because we run the ISA platforms across all measures, we run PAS across the measures and ultimately we're the one on the hook for a guarantee for 25 years when we guarantee it. Uh, we're moving more and more into retrofit coordinator certification, um, carding and competency, development of training and qualifications to make sure that the in installers can, can, can match the requirements under PAS 2030. We've just spent 16 weeks developing the new national innovation standards help help develop the new MVQs. So there's a whole compliance regime now that um, across all measures that supports installers end to end. Yeah. Um, and some of that will also be things like offering a design service where we can or retrofit coordinates something where we can. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, that's great. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep us moving. Um, if I could ask um, the of incredibly interesting speakers uh, to to try and be, how's, what's the polite word? Succinct. You're all being as succinct as you possibly can. We've just got so much to get through and I want to cover as much ground as we can. Um, David Glue from Leeds Beckett University. Um, uh, it, this, 
this is another question about cost, really, and whether the energy companies are going to be prepared to go the extra mile and cover this cost. I think we've probably covered it. Is there anything else any member of the panel would like to say on that? Or have we covered it? I think we probably have. Mm. Okay. Okay, so here's an interesting one from Martin Jervis from Cubot. Um, and his question is, how could PAS 2035 go wrong? I'm going to throw that to the man who wrote it, Peter. Right. Um, there's about a million ways it could go wrong. It's, it's a big, complicated standard. And that's why there's a big, complicated steering group that keeps it together. Um, I think it could price itself out if we're not careful. It could be too expensive and complicated to deliver. So we've, got, we've always had to be really careful about that. But, you know, people like Nigel on the steering group and his colleagues from the industry have tried really hard to make sure that we keep things deliverable and proportionate. Um, I've looked back at some of the previous um, standards and, which have gone wrong. And for example, we were just talking about ventilation. Ventilation was in past 2030, 2017, and nobody did it. They just ignored it. And, uh, you know, so we could have people ignoring chunks of the standard. I think now we've got a much more robust um, framework with Trustmark at the head of it, uh, looking for compliance and uh, the, the Academy uh, Centre of Excellence doing guidance and so on. So we've put into, get into place quite a rich infrastructure to make sure it doesn't go wrong. We are also about to start on an amendment of PAS 2035, and there has been a long and elaborate process, which many people have contributed to, about fixing little bits that don't work very well, moving into areas we couldn't get into before, and so on. So it's not a fixed thing that might fall over one day. I hope it will be responsive and flexible as we go through this transition and implementation process, and we'll keep it as, as focused and relevant as we can. Okay. But you know, things that go wrong in Retfit, go wrong because you don't anticipate them and it's just as true of the standards as it is of the actual ret retrofit so let's see okay that's fine i think um the, the elephant in the room clearly here is how how can we uh, deliver this standard at scale affordably um which is a huge part of what the center of excellence will be working on uh, and in fact the starting one of the starting points for the center of excellence was a group of us trying to work out how we could deliver that service affordably and really realizing that at the minute we didn't know how to do it either. So um, I don't think there is an answer to all of it yet, but clearly we need it. Um, James Tyus has made a number of comments um, and I've engaged with James a lot over the last year. Um, his view is that this will go the way of the Green Deal. Um, and I'd like to ask Phil Mason why, in quality terms at least, why that won't be the case. Hey, um... <laughs> Well, firstly, I think Green Deal was more of a funding mechanism and, and, and where we are now is more about a focus on quality. Uh, I think the, the, the constitution of Trustmark working through scheme providers that offer the technical expertise in their own sort of respective areas is, cons is considerably different. Um, and I, I also think that where Trustmark sits sort of in that position sort of... Um, licensing scheme providers we 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 keep a a sort of compliance process a, a sort of pro, a risk-based proportionate compliance process in place um with scheme providers and 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 the relationship with them is is fairly communicative um and i rate it as good uh, and i think it's just a i just think it i've got to be concise david forgive me i think it's a different operation to green deal in terms of the compliance and the view to quality Okay. Summary. Okay. That's great. Now here's a, a cracking question. I'm going to throw it straight at Andre because presumably he knows this gentleman. So what is the right honourable Alex Sharma's true stance at present on this strategy, which I took to mean whole house retrofit at scale? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, to be honest, I don't, I don't really think he had, he, it's something he's, thought about that much uh, in certainly in his time as base secretary of state because he has mainly been dealing with COVID and the response to COVID. Uh, I know however that um, Minister Kwarteng who's the energy minister uh, is 
is aware of this because the the last debate in the house that uh, that happened before the lockdown or that that he did was on on the issue of quality and i had to brief him ahead of that so so he was he was um his stance was right we we know things have gone uh, wrong in the past and we have, have to admit to that but we are putting in steps to make sure things don't or not make sure but try to make sure that things uh, don't go wrong in the past and consumers are properly protected and these are the sorts of things that ministers are very sensitive to if they get calls from their constituents or letters from their colleagues uh, pass on from their constituents if things are going wrong they are um, they are really sensitive to that um, and at the moment it's quite easy because they're new ministers to say okay those things were in the past but you know as as it, their policies become implemented they will um, I think judging by what ministers are like generally they'll want to ensure that they minimize uh, problems with uh, with consumers Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of that section. Just to reassure Mr. Tyus that we are going to address the point he keeps making on the chat, but it's in, it sits in the next section. So um, if we could just uh, hold that one. Now, I was about to, at this point, launch a poll, um, but I appear to have launched it some time ago. And many of you have answered it. So I think we can uh, look at the results of this. <laughs> um, so, uh, I will share this on screen. So these these were questions. Forgive me if you haven't seen this. I've made a right pig's ear of this bit. Um, the questions were: Do you feel that the eco sector as a whole is well prepared for PAS 2035? Um, and uh, we've had a, plenty of votes here. Uh, very few saying yes, we're ready or well prepared. 52% uh, saying no, we're not. Uh, but 43% making good progress. And I bet that's a better number than it would have been. Uh, in March when we last did this. Um, there was a question here specifically to uh, the sort of independent retrofit coordinators. There are a lot of you, I'd recognize your names, a lot of you on this call, um, whether you had found demand for your services so far, because you would think that qualified accredited coordinators would be heavily in demand at the minute. But uh, half of you there saying, no, you're not. Uh, only 23% saying yes. And that, I think that reinforces in my mind that we really need to get the retro book thing moving because I know full well there is demand for your services and you're just not finding one another at the minute. Um, finally, um, number three is a retrofit coordinator. Does your employer or client allow you to act as the project manager uh, on projects from cradle to grave, which is what it's intended to be, how it's designed to be? Um, here, 37% of you said yes, as per past 2035, which is encouraging. I didn't expect the number to be that high. 58% uh, partly, it's still a work in progress, but you're getting there. Um, and then 5% saying, no, I'm, I'm being asked to rubber stamp, rubber stamp jobs, essentially retrospectively, uh, which is really where we don't want to be. Um, so uh, we have another poll at the end of the next section, which I won't launch now, um, and we'll do it at the appropriate time. Okay, um, so moving on. Okay, so this next section is all about retrofit in practice. So how can we practice, particularly as retrofit coordinators, but the other roles, including assessors, and how can we collaborate more effectively? Um, some of these I'm probably best placed to answer, uh, so I will do if so, and I'll just keep us moving. Um, this one, um, how do you go from qualifying as a retrofit coordinator to putting this in place? Um, it's definitely one for me, uh, I think, and I'll, but I'll bring Peter in too in a minute. Um, it's this issue which has led to us working with Bayes on putting this PAS into practice program in place, because there's, there's immediately come away with a qualification, you join a scheme, the scheme's still finding its feet, there's clearly a gap between uh, a challenge for you to work out what to do, not just in terms of acting as a coordinator, but finding the work in the first place with the right kind of clients. So that's why we've put that support program in place. The logical answer to your question, Mr. Southwell, is uh, you gain a qualification, you join a scheme, you're then in the market because you're qualified and accredited. So you go to Elmhurst, Stroma, ECMK or Quidos, and soon to be the IAA, Nigel, 
um, and and everything else should fall into place from there. But um, uh, the other gap that we found uh, was that there was a lack of clarity about what steps you would need to go through to ensure as a coordinator you were doing everything that the PAS requires of you. And that's why we built the retrofit coordinator uh, process maps, um, which are published and available to everybody on the retrofit academy website. If you haven't seen those yet, strongly recommend that you do. Does anyone have anything to add on that one? No. Nope. We'll move on then. Um, this question from Paul Wilkins. Once we are qualified, how do we start to produce reports? Phil, you were. Uh, you comment on this one? Or am I being unfair? You're muted, Phil. Okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm uh, butterfingers. Um, I think what this is about is to start producing reports. I think this is about this um, uh, connection back to the centre of excellence and the tools that are being prepared there, uh, that are being produced there. And I think it's also about um, the platforms that the schemes the retrofit coordinator schemes and the retrofit assessor schemes uh, the, the assessors perhaps uh, slightly more advanced because they've had more history in it are starting to produce platforms um, that I am will do all possible to drive that link back to the central point of truth being the um, the templates that have been produced so that the the, the, the equipment and the tools and the, and the and the digital technologies there to to start helping produce reports in a considerably more and straightforward system dread dread driven um sort of functionality really mm. yeah okay so the, the there's not it's not surprising given that we've only launched a template today that people don't mm. Uh, mm. see the solution there yeah. um but in the fullness of time uh the the way in which uh you, you know the coordinators and people currently work with uh, on, on the eco through the ecoserve platform or the scheme platforms um they will come into existence over the next six to twelve months i would imagine uh, and certainly we'd like to support all of those people in doing so by uh, by by uh, sharing our templates Okay, now I've uh, deleted the name of the accreditation scheme here and the number of asterisks in no way reflects who that scheme is because none of them have six asterisks, I don't think, anyway. So this individual, Roy Rogers says, we've registered with a scheme as our accreditation buddy for retrofit, but they don't seem to be fully ready yet. Um, will there be allowances made initially when being audited as a result of this? I think that's one for Phil again. I think it is. Okay. Um... Right, well, I don't think it's right for me to comment on individual schemes, obviously, because no. that, that just isn't right. Um, but I, I, I think there's a, there's a pragmatic approach that's, that's being delivered here. Um, now, I, I'm very, I've very firmly got my Trustmark Head of Compliance hat on, um, and that is that compliance is, is essential because that's what it's here, and we can't allow people to start getting into uh, or drive bad habits from the, from the onset. But I think in terms of allowances, there's things that might form... Uh, minor non-compliances, which are still non-compliances, but they're, they're, they're areas where schemes can work um, with their membership in order to drive um, the, the, the help and support that's needed with it. I think where we get into areas where we might have more sort of major non-compliance that, that runs the risk of actually physically producing detriment in someone's home or property, uh, I think that's a different issue, but I think it's about a pragmatic approach because it's new. There's a lot of learning going through in industry, um, but it's got to be set at a level that that doesn't allow bad habits to come in and doesn't set an unacceptable tolerance level. Um, but I think there's understanding needed to be shown about this. And I think it's talking with your schemes, those of you who are registered with schemes, about the processes and how it works. I mean, they're not all individual conversations because um, that might not necessarily be practicable, but but there is... There, there has to be a tolerance approach. Okay. Um, supplementary one, Phil. Uh, Peter Draper has asked on the chat which schemes are running yet. Um, he says Quidos aren't as yet, but I, I believe they are. I think they're open for business. Uh, I think there's four, uh, four retrofit coordinator schemes. Uh, ECMK, uh, Stroma Certification, Quidos. Um, why can't I remember the last one? Terrible for me to do. Uh, and the last one... Elmhurst. 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 El forgive me. Forgive me, Elmhurst. Um, so I'll say it again, Elmhurst. <laughs> okay, and and there are a couple more coming through the system. Uh, there's, there's, yes, there's aspirin um, 
organizations working through the system now. Great. Okay, fine. Let's move on. Um, so James, I told you we'd get to your question and I knew it was here because I wrote this earlier. So the PAS 2035 roadmap, which are the process maps that the Academy produced is very <laughs> extensive. Uh, do you seriously expect assessors to perform all these stages? I'm going to throw that one at Peter. It could uh, be a short answer. The simple answer is yes. Uh, but that's why we're building the templates and the process map checklists to make sure that it's easy to see what's got to be done and people will get used to doing it. And actually, I think on the rhetoric coordinator process map, there are 114 tasks, if I remember rightly. Um, but I reckon more than half of those will become almost automatic routine as soon as people get into the habit of operating with PATH 2035. Um, that is the penalty for doing things properly, I'm afraid. And um, what we're trying to do with the tem templates and things is to help to automate those complicated stages and processes in such a way that we take cost out of the process and risk. Okay, that's great. Uh, also, if an assessor is doing an awful lot more than they're currently doing and providing a different kind of service, would you say that they should be rethinking their own pricing and business models? I was just going to comment on that. I think, I think it's about, yes, these things do need to be done, but I think people need to move away from the drive-by EPC rate of 25 quid and, you know, and the, the sort of low cost of doing just an eco survey. I mean, you know, they, they've got to be paid in our view, you know, they shouldn't be doing more than two of these assessments a day if it's done properly. So they need to be paid properly to do that. So yeah, that's yeah, indeed. And that will take time uh, to take shape just in the same way the coordinators uh, remuneration will take time to take shape. OK, let's move on. Um, a question about independent advice. Um, so Kate Watson from the Centre for Sustainable Energy says uh, the guidance presuming past 2035 says the householder will need to be offered independent advice after the plan is presented to them. What does this mean? Um, I think that's one for Peter. Yeah, actually it doesn't say that. It says that it has to be offered advice by a qualified advisor. And um, it doesn't have to be independent. The advice can be given by a qualified advisor working for the assessor, working for the installer, working with the retrofit coordinator could actually be the retrofit coordinator if suitably qualified. Um, I think actually the advice part of PAS 2035 is its weakest aspect and I've been having conversations this very morning with NEA about how we can perhaps improve it. Um, the idea is to get the householder well informed about what could happen to their house, what the processes is, what the options are for their house and once they've got them installed how to make the best of them and uh, that's always been the intention. We've been trying to um, segment the sort of flat advice that's been given by energy advisors in the past, mostly because they've been based in the local authority or housing association sector and advising tenants without improvements. So we're trying to refocus that. We were unfortunate that we lost the um, energy information and advice hub that was an outcome, a recommendation of each home counts. Um, and I think there are, well, I know there are some steps being taken now to try and get that back to recover that because the information advice host will give us a, an authoritative source of information um, provided by trained people that anybody in, this, in the process can draw on to use as the source of the information they need. Yeah. Um, so it's not independent. That's the key bit of the answer, I think. Okay. It doesn't have to be independent. You've answered that question very clearly. Uh, Phil Mason, am I right in thinking that Trustmark have a sort of consumer facing website that might provide some very good householder guidance? Um, okay, you're probably talking about the, the uh, property hub. Yes. Um, so there's all sorts of things that can be connected to that. So currently that's in, in, in a, in a, in a uh, sort of beta state. Uh, although it's live, we're not actively driving um, traffic towards it because we want to see organically how it develops and how it's used so that we can see how we can deliver the plan, um, uh, taking into account that sort of organic learning about how it can uh, can be used and more people can be driven to it. But that that's the area uh, that we envisage that, that, that support of that nature can be, um, okay. can be capped. Thank you very much. 
I think there's a lot of work to be done around that advice sector as well. Uh, two related questions here on underfloor insulation, which was a uh, bit of a boom market under uh, in eco uh, of late. Uh, Ian Maysmith, the retrofit coordinator, asks if underfloor insulation can be carried out on suspended timber, but not under solid floors in the same property, or, or does the whole property have to be installed? Um, sort of related question to that is um, from Stephen Mulverhill asking about whether foam glass aggregates can be used for solid floor insulation. Uh, it seems to be a practical solution for retrofit. Uh, are there any known problems with that? I'm going to point that at Peter again. Actually, I don't know the answer to either of those questions. Hey. I think the top one is an eco question. It's about what the rules say. Can you do half the floor? Um, the second one is a technical question, which I think has to come from somebody in the insulation industry. So I'm going to bounce that one at Nigel, I think. Okay. Can I pick up on the um, underfloor insulation? I think this has been a bit of an issue with Ofgem's nervousness around um, condensation risk. So we've been battling with, I'm not Ofgem are on here, but we've been kind of battling uh, around this because uh, you have to do 100% of the measure under eco. So a measure is either sus suspended floor, so that's with timber to suspended floor or solid floor. So if you do 100% of the suspended floor, which is relatively easy in, in older houses where you've got timber at the front perhaps and a sort of a concrete floor at the back you can do that element and you can leave the kitchen at the back but if the whole floor is solid you have to do a hundred percent of the floor so that means lifting bathrooms toilets tiles kitchens they won't allow you under recent guidance to 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 leave those areas so it, it seems a bit crazy to me that you can leave it yeah, you can leave the back part, the kitchen area, if it's solid when you're doing the timber floor, but you can't leave it if it's solid floor. And I think I'm hoping that, you know, through the work of uh, the new pairs and ventilation going in and, you know, Ofgem will get comfortable enough to, to say, actually, the coordinators looked at this and they think the risk is, is, is minimal for, you know, leaving this small area around the toilet system or whatever that might be. Okay. Uh, Nigel, uh, Sega produced best practice guidance around this, I think. Nigel, are you there? I'm here, sorry, I was filled the evidence test, I was muted. Um, we led on a, a project on behalf of Bayes for development of a underflow insulation um, technical guide, which will be published very shortly. The, the final finishing touches are being made to it. Um, that really focuses on the approach, and it is about engineering out them thermal bridges. It's about knowing something about the, the, um, the moisture value of the timbers before you go ahead. Um, all them pre-checks we would hope people are doing anyway. Um, in terms of the, the second question around foam glass aggregate, like all these things, um, pre preference is an approved system. You need to understand the limitations if there are, there are any of, of, of how it performs. There are a number of underflow insulation systems that are being approved by Kiwa BDA and the BBA at the moment, so we're starting to get more systemized approaches to it. Um, so, and it really is about, you know, so for example, Ubot is a, um, Braid foam type solution um, and it's an approved system under the BBA and it's factored into the underfloor information guide, technical information guide so in theory no there isn't anything prohibiting it other than the appropriate um, approval by aggregate bodies and manufacturers. Okay thank you. We'll uh, look forward to the guidance. Uh, Stephen uh, Mulvihill asked the next question too uh, which is uh, about products and systems so it's sort of following on from that. Uh, uh, it says it would be good to have a list of companies who will invite you for a demonstration of their products if you require further practical guidance, whether it's for insulation or ventilation equipment. Uh, I'm going to answer that one. Um, I, I agree with you uh, on that. And I think it's actually quite hard uh, for you to, well, two levels. One, find the innovative stuff that's out there, because that just leaves you and the web to work it out. Uh, and uh, the other is to know whether you can see past the, the greenwash uh, uh, that, that, that a manufacturer might put on it. So that's why we've, we're, we're opening up the Centre of Excellence to manufacturers to join, um, but we will subject them to a critique before we allow them, and that, that critique will be carried out by one of our tutors or one of our assessors. So, um, and it, I won't be content to accept until the, the, the membership until they are content. Um, and I think there's something in that, Stephen. So we don't have an answer for you, but it's definitely something that we need to look at. Um, moving on, um, retrofit design. Um, I think the question is, 
uh, really about whether this whether the design responsible issue should sit with a system provider rather than a specific sort of architect or surveyor retrofit designer type person does anyone have a want to take that one i'll take that one thank you um yes is the answer um i think go quite far enough at the moment it recognizes in path a that where there's a single measure that is a system the best person to design that is the system supplier or somebody working or trained for or trained by the system supplier um, uh, we've put in a provision that the retrofit coordinator has to still review it to make sure that it's an appropriate design for that dwelling given what the retrofit coordinator knows about the assessment and so on i think that what we will be doing in the forthcoming update to past 2035 is making available the option of specialist designers working with their systems to provide designs as part of the overall design so i think what's currently in path a um, i'm hoping will extend to all paths if you have a package of measures of say five measures in your whole house retrofit and two of them are proprietary systems it would seem to me to be eminently sensible that the retrofit designer should uh, get those two proprietary systems designed by the specialists but they still have to coordinate the design as people have many times heard, heard me say retrofit goes wrong at the corners junctions and edges so it's where one design for one measure meets the others uh, so there's still a role to coordinate the specialist designs and make sure they're appropriate and connected together properly okay fantastic david can, sorry, can i just add something very quickly there as well from a from a from an installer and operative type of point of view um, part of the new occupational standards for the MVQs for installation measures now include a mandatory interface unit, which, to, to, to Peter's point, that, that them failings at the, the corners and edges, it's it set up to address just that um, from an installer level so they can understand what might go wrong and you know, in, a, in the physical application of it. Um, it links together yeah. nicely. I think, though, that we have to deal with systems that are boilers and heat pumps and ventilation systems as well as insulation. So there's still quite a lot of those interfaces, if not corners, junctions and edges, we have to pay attention to. OK, uh, this is a question that's that's come up quite a lot um, and I've struggled to give a clear answer to it, I feel. Um, does the retrofit coordinator have to visit site during the installation to a single measure at a single property? And if not in that example, what is the point at which they do have to um, visit site? Shall I do that one too, or at least start it? Yes. Um, there's no requirement for the retrofit coordinator to go on site in past 2035. However, I would, I would consider it essential in most cases. Single measures are a bit of a special case. Um, what past 2035 says is that the retrofit coordinator represents the client's interests and indeed the public interest during the installation process the installation process is the responsibility of the installer but he is the installer he or she is required to give the retrofit coordinator free access to the work on site to inspect progress and quality and to oversee testing commissioning and handover so um, it's the, the opportunity to go on site is there i think the retrofit coordinator has to take a judgment related to the complexity of the job the complexity of the measures the reliability of the installer and all those things as to whether the coordinator actually needs to be there okay that's interesting thank you very much nice and clear okay um right this is one i'm going to answer um albeit you might want to, any of you might want to comment on the 60-day transition period specifically um, but the question is about uh, wh why a, an accreditation scheme like Elmhurst, Stroma, ECMK or Quidos will accept a coordinator uh, registration when they started their training with the academy, um, even though that might take 12 months. So I just want to clear something up here. They should not accept you as a retrofit coordinator uh, as soon as you've signed up for the course. There's a very clear understanding with all of those schemes that you must be 75% complete. And by that, that means that you've had your work assessed on uh, nine of the 12 units uh, and you can evidence that you have passed those. So uh, a scheme who's allowed you on that, uh, that, that, that just on the basis that you've signed up for the course, uh, that, that hasn't been the case for a long time now. So if that's, not, if that's a recent conversation, you need to get in touch with that scheme again and, and, uh, and check. I don't think there's anything else to say on that, sir. 
unless any any of you wants to come the, the in. The only thing for me is that the, the sixty day transition yeah. isn't isn't really designed, although it may help with retrofit coordinators um, finishing their qualification uh, and getting or, or getting to that point where, and getting registration. The sixty day transitional period was 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 designed to allow installers that had past 2030 2017 uh, jobs in the pipeline that had either been surveyed and quoted or physical work had started um, so that they had a period of time where they could lodge them after their transition to uh, the, the newest certification that's what the 60 days was about but there is inevitability that as somebody's going through that period that 60 days may uh, may allow someone that uh, a retrofit coordinator that's well progressed uh, along their qualification to actually finish it as part of that, that transitional period. So, but that wasn't his design, though. No. Okay. All right. Thank you, Phil. Okay. Um, Tim Beecher asks: Are there plans to make it easier for retrofit assessors to get training in more in-depth survey methods, uh, such as uh, NFIT survey standards, which I believe is the uh, passive house planning package? Is anyone aware of anything, any initiatives around that, or are we going to stick with RDSAT? Well, the Passive House Trust do offer training in uh, aspects of Passive House, including Innofit and the various stages of it. So there is, there is material out there. And some of the carbon light retrofit training covers using Innofit in different ways, using Innofit and PHPP. So I think that material is available. It's just perhaps not as formalized as one might want it to be, but there is certainly stuff there. We're very conscious that there are more things required of a retrofit assessor than are in the uh, DEA training, but quite a few of the accreditation bodies who are setting up retrofit assessor schemes are covering the extra material themselves. So I, foc I think this, the focus of this question is on going even further. Um, and I would point people at the Passive House uh, Trust for that. Okay, that's fine. We, um, we've also uh, agreed to develop a course ourselves on the use of PHPP in retrofit. That's one of the CPD courses that we, we've agreed to create. Um, okay, um, this final one is a very, very key question, I think, um, and we, I know we don't have the answer to it, um, but I think a, a discussion around it would be very worthwhile. Are there plans to make apprenticeships and training easily accessible for builders in deep retrofit uh, building methods? So are we going to be having people coming out of colleges, uh, knowing, their, uh, knowing their solid walls from their, <laughs> their whatever else? Um, we have views on this and, and, and what needs to happen to make that happen. I'll start, I'll start with, a, with, 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 a, with a personal view and that is you need a sustainable market to entice awarding organisations to develop qualifications. You need an industry to take the lead on development of the standards, but awarding organisations look at profit and loss. And if the volume is not sufficient in a particular area, they won't take that leap of faith. Uh, the other thing that we need to do, certainly on the insulation side, having developed them entry level, level two qualifications, we lack any of the any of the progression. It's not attractive to young people to come into that industry because they look at it as being, well, I'm going to be on the tools. There's not a formal progression as to how they move from there to a level three, how they move on to become an assessor, how they move on to become a retrofit coordinator. It's a big leap from level two to level five in some cases. Yes, it is. And, the, and the, the only the only the only link is to the construction site supervisor qualifications. Um, which are not appropriate. They, 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 you know, they give some generic leadership um, development, but what they don't do is give the, the job specific stuff. So there's a lot of work to do, and it stems from having a sustainable market and something to go at, so that industry is prepared to invest in its workforce. Yeah, absolutely. Which is one of the uh, bringing uh, a lot of the installers together through the centre of excellence may make that slightly easier. Um, and what I was going to suggest here is that we might look to form a, a skills and training working group through the Centre of Excellence that uh, you know, bring a broad group of people together to look at that challenge strategically. Um, so, uh, and the work you've done on national occupational standards, Nigel, is, is really, really first class. So um, a lot needs to happen here, and particularly as some of the uh, proposals around the stimulus package uh, and the scale in the market, some of the sort of city regions who are putting forward quite big proposals around retrofit. If that starts to kick in, then we're going to need that workforce very, very quickly. Um, so it's not something we can afford to, uh, to, to, to delay. Okay, that brings us to the end of that section. We are um, down to the last 10 minutes.
Um, so there's only a few questions here. I'm just going to get straight into them. Um, this one from Richard Shears is, a, is, is, a, is an important one. I don't quite understand what he's getting at, so, and I did try and phone him earlier to um, clarify. Um, but the question reads, if scheme operators offer retrofit coordinator services for free to their mentors, how can a race to the bottom be avoided? So I, I don't know if Richard's on the call, he's welcome to unmute himself and explain that. But uh, otherwise, does anyone get the question to the extent they can answer it? I don't get the question, but I think there, there probably is a comment that you kind of made earlier on about um, the, the potential for people to set up the rubber stamping rhetoric co you know, coordinators, the, the person that's based remotely that will just sign off jobs for 75 quid, I just think is completely the, the wrong way for the market to go. Uh, yeah, and I, and I, hope, I hope that doesn't happen. Briefly, if I can add to that, through through the um, sort of compliance monitoring, we, whilst Trustmark hasn't got an interest in, in what or a direct interest in in the cost of services. I mean, we've got a wider interest, obviously, but a direct interest in the, the cost of services. If 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 services are offered at an unsustainable level and it leads to cutting corners, the compliance process will identify it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Richard has clarified here. He meant members rather than mentors, uh, which I, which does make more sense. Um, the answer still applies. If 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 unsustainable uh, costing uh, business models to offer services lead yeah. to cutting corners will it'll, it'll be identified okay that's great um the, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, about independence of retrofit coordinators and assessors and whether they should be in-house or independent this one sort of captured the question on behalf of many other people can the installer have the retrofit coordinator and assessor in-house or do they have to be independent Uh, well, I, I can answer that. They, uh, they, they can be in-house. Uh, they don't have to be independent, but conflict of interest has to be managed, uh, uh, has to be declared and managed. So I, I suppose it's how you, how you go around two sides for square. Uh, if it's, if th th there's risk, whether somebody's independent, because you just go from independent to independent to independent until you find uh, uh, somebody that would, would, would suit the need, uh, or if they're in, in internal, there's no greater or reduced risk of of um, uh, lack of independence. I just think it's about it's, it's about manic declaring conflict and managing it. Okay. Any other comments? And we'll move on. Um, and here we've got from Bill Wright, uh, who's a retrofit coordinator, currently working his way through the course. He's thinking about recommending a whole house package to a homer. Great. Delighted about that. Um, they may, may only want parts of it uh, that they feel they can afford. Um, what, what options are available, what funding options are available that he could tell those homeowners about that might persuade them to accept the full package? Um, can I just yeah. mention it? Just, um, I think within ECO, there are certain measures, particularly sort of electrically heated homes, if you're having central heating and insulation, um, it's, it's in the, well, depending on how the, the ECO installer or the funder provides the grant to the customer it's in their interest to have the whole package so if they for example said um, actually I'll have the, the central heating but I don't want my loft done potentially there's perhaps three thousand pounds available for that loft that could help to go and offset the cost of the work so it depends on how the works are funded but potentially it's better for them to have the whole package and I think it's good it's a good practice for eco installers to to share some of those very you know well funded jobs with some of the least funded to try and enable the whole package to be done as near to free as possible okay that's fine can I, can I add something to that please yeah. which is that i think it's important to emphasize that under pass 2035 whole house retrofit doesn't mean doing it all at once very good thing to do if you can and you can afford it but the idea is to have a whole house plan that may take 20 or 30 years to do all of it so if the homeowner is not able to afford or not technically confident enough to do all of it then part of the process is finding the bits to do first, putting them in a logical order and so on. Indeed. So, Bill, I don't know if you've got to the bit in the course where we talk about the whole house retrofit plan or the medium term retrofit plan, but that's, that's what that's there to do. And it's part of the tools that we've just developed. Uh, Mark Elton, um, uh, a well-known retrofit designer. Hello, Mark. 
He asks, what could be done to convince RSLs to adopt uh, 55 now? Um, and before I throw that open to uh, a number of you who could comment, um, we say we've already formed a working group through the Centre of Excellence of Social Landlords. Uh, we have our first meeting of that next Wednesday. Um, and that's very exciting because between them, they're responsible for 2.4 billion properties. And they're all desperate to find a way of driving large scale retrofit in those. In our programs. So, I think that, but what, what could we do to convince RSL now to adopt the 2030 Peter, I know you have a lot to say on this. <laughs> well, um, when I'm working with several RSLs to try and get them to do that, I think that most RSLs' hearts are in the right place. <laughs> Keen to do retrofit well. Somebody has Could you mute your microphone, please, if you're not speaking? Very well. That's better. Um, so um, I think one of the problems is that Eco and uh, the Pazes and so on belong to Bates and RSLs belong to MHCLG in terms of responsibilities. So it's quite difficult for um, the two departments going to have to work together. What we need is through the regulator to put quite a bit of pressure on RSLs who are mostly focused on compliance these days with lots of other things and not on um, retrofit. So there's a long way to go with them. But I think their hearts in the right place. They are interested in being Thank you, Peter, and thanks for battling with the background noise. And again, if you can hear me, if your microphone is not working, please answer. Out of Africa, is that tenable? It's Broad Oak 36 that's causing the noise. Broad Oak 36, thank you very much. I shall find him a mute. Well, whilst I'm doing that, could you. Um... <laughs> Uh, any other thoughts from the panel on, on uh, engaging RSLs, social landlords? I don't know whether Andre's still on the call, but the, 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 big, the big thing will be, you know, let's keep our fingers crossed we get some um, fiscal stimulant um, coming out of COVID and we get something, we get this commitment to energy efficiency. And then it's really important that um, if government are committed to 2035, then any funding that goes that way is past 2035 and past 2030. Which we um, expect it will be. That's yeah, cool. and uh, so that so that will that will ta tackle it. And the, and the only other point to make is, we traditionally have not promoted a race to the bottom, but in terms of the way we've priced work, the pay, the, in the terms of the way in which um, eco has operated, it has led in some cases to the wrong decisions. And you know, if we're serious about whole house retrofit, we've got to get the pricing points right. You can't do a cheap loft job anymore. You've got to do a job and do it properly. And to do that, you've got to be funded properly for it. So. Um, the only way we're going to get this to work and to prevent any of the operating in the grey areas is to make sure that we get consistent funding across installers and, and they recognise there is a cost to do it. And it doesn't help anybody by, by reducing that cost to a level where it's just not simple, simply, you know, you're not simply able to, to comply. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We're, um, we're, there's a proposal going forward to base um, from the uh, Direct Works forum which we're working with which I think has got a lot of merit and it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Um, okay just a couple of um, final questions again the best answered by me um, they were sort of in the miscellaneous category really. Um, John Abbott from Keegan's asked if the learning materials from the retrofit coordinator course should be available afterwards after you've completed the course. Um, it's one of those questions I'd love to say the answer to it as of course yes it goes without saying but unfortunately there are costs involved to us for every year in which those materials are made available to you so uh, and we also want to continue to invest into them so that they're a living document things that they involve over time so uh, what we will do involve. is include those in the, uh, the those learning materials in the individual memberships of the center of excellence so if you you don't have to buy buy it separately um, so there's a simple answer to that they're available to you for two years from the date you start the course and then after that through ongoing membership of the center um, and then um, finally, Vincent. Hello, Vincent. Um, you asked. You, you've asked about this before. Is there any update on pay-per-click insurance for retrofit coordinators? Uh, yes, there is. Um, we found an insurance broker who understood all about retrofit, 
and PAS 2035. And we've sent our details out to you in the Retrofit Coordinator newsletter a couple of times. If you want those details, uh, just email me and I'll pass them on to you. Uh, I asked her about the pay-per-click option. She said it's a total non-starter. So the only update I can give you is that's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to the panel there. Um, the discussion I just wanted to have quickly, and I think we, if it's okay, we'll just run five minutes over to do this, um, was really around this sort of the context we currently find ourselves in. Um, and I feel very much that it's a time for calm heads and for working through the challenges that we face together uh, and pragmatically and sensibly recognizing that this period of change, introducing new standards and uh, dealing with a global pandemic are, are fairly unique challenges. So uh, is that a view uh, that you share and, and how could we work together more effectively to make sure that, that we do that? Andre, perhaps you could, you could comment here. Um, yeah, I mean, time for calm heads. Definitely time. Hope. Well, I am optimistic. Um, obviously, we're we're awaiting what happens with the Chancellor's speech next week. But you would think, with uh, net zero commitments, the the COP coming up next year, um, the need to uh, even the statements yesterday, even though they weren't directly about. Uh, retrofit there was about that there were statements about rebuilding greener so I think a time for, for optimism generally I appreciate that the people on this call may be struggling and, and uh, you know they've, they've moved over to this standard and they're seeing themselves priced out of eco the term isn't great and I absolutely appreciate that but I think the medium to longer term um, is it, outlook is positive and it is a case as you say, uh, David, of working together, and and um, just be just be mindful that we uh, the, the civil service is really stretched at the moment. It's been stretched due to Brexit now, COVID. So we don't have all the all the ideas. We don't we don't um, have all the resources. We don't have all the expertise. So we really rely on uh, you to to tell us things are going wrong, but also. <laughs> Part, I mean, part of our job is finding the solutions, but we're going to be reliant on on you uh, as organisations feeding through the the Retrofit Academy, the Centre of Excellence, and through certification bodies to to help to help us to come up with the right solutions because we won't be able to come up with those solutions on our own. Indeed, and Andre, I think I'd like to thank you on behalf of lots of people who've shared this sentiment with me for being so approachable and so open to suggestions um, for, for someone who's clearly very busy and working under very challenging circumstances. So thanks for everything you do too. And yeah, we'll continue to yeah. go and bring people together uh, and respond to that. And I'm aware of at least three big proposals that are being put forward to you, big ideas that are being put forward to you this week. Um, so let's hope that they get do get some traction. Um, does any of the other panel just have a, any closing remarks? Well, to follow um, Andre up, I was going to say, um, I think this is a time of really huge opportunity for Retrofit. Um, I mean, I've been in a small community of people for probably 30 years who've been trying to work towards a domestic retrofit program for uh, at the national scale. We've never been nearer to it than we are now. So, and we've put many of the bits in place. So I think it's a good time for calm heads, but it's also a good time for being aware that there are big prizes to win. Indeed, agreed. Phil? Well, I, I, what I was going to say was just a subset of what, what Peter said, but not quite so concisely and not in such nice words. We'll let you off. <laughs> okay, fine. Nigel? You feeling positive and calm? Sorry. Yes, I'm feeling extremely positive. I don't know about calm. Um, <laughs> no, let's see what's what, let's see what's around the corner. My my glass is certainly it's not half full. It's kind of brimming over at the moment. I hope that comes to reality. Um, I think the challenge is 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 the timing of getting an industry back to work. We're out on the ground now. We've got installers installing. Um, we've got some positive homeowner experiences. We're working to safe working practices. 
um, and you know business is continuing as usual. It's just there's an awful lot of the industry who are waiting and, and you know that leap of faith waiting to see when they take people off um, furlough, when they um, put the crews back on the road because the worst thing they could possibly do is bring people back in and you know and it'd be a spectacular flop. So, uh, you know, yes, positive. Let's hope we get some positive announcements out through the Chancellor. Um, because I think there's a great future for the industry. If we do. Agreed, indeed. Adrian, any closing remarks from you? Yeah, obviously COVID's been quite challenging for, for all the companies uh, in terms of being unable to work. And I think even when we're trying to get back to work, uh, trying to uh, make people feel safe for us to, to go into their homes, I think you know, e eco and the implementation of, of past 2035 um, has its challenges. But I think, you know, all I can say is I'm glad that the um, the group was to set up the working group and centre of excellence several weeks ago because I think probably um, that happened just at the right time uh, and you know I, I remain positive that you know everyone around the table is is sort of acting you know pragmatically and positively to try and get things moving I think we're all pushing in the same direction we all want this to, to be successful um, and looking forward to the multi-billion pound uh, check that Andre is going to write to us uh, in, a, in a few weeks time which I'm sure is definitely the case. I don't remember him saying that Adrian but I may have missed it I'll listen I'll do a transcript and check um, okay. thank you very much everybody and um, we've had um, over, well over 120 of you who've um, who've stayed with this all the way through the past two hours so I hope you've enjoyed it and taken lots from it I'm aware there are